Now that feces and fan blades are about to be reacquainted again, and I'll show you why I say that a little bit later in this video. Before then, it raises the question, why couldn't Jay Powell see this coming? Why didn't the financial media report to the public that this was the predictable, maybe even inevitable set of outcomes? In fact, the financial media, in fact, most of the mainstream, uh, mainstream press itself simply takes the word of those like Jay Powell, those in position of authority, regardless of whether they demonstrate any authority whatsoever. Now, to, to really to, to get a taste of the answer to these questions, I want to go through a couple quotes from an article that was sent to me by my good friend and former Eurodollar University co-host, Emil Kalinowski, who's still out there scouring the world for Eurodollar clues, the first documented use of bank reserves outside the banking system, and he really uncovered a gem here. It says, the problem is not that there is so much money changing hands around the world these days, even though far more money is moving faster and farther than ever before. The problem is that no one is watching. The sense that bankers and not governments slowly but surely have taken hold of the future has begun to worry some people. But it is now clear that the world has grown to depend upon an extremely complex, yet at the same time delicate, 20-year-old financial system that is understood by few and, more importantly, that avoids regulation by any existing government body. That wasn't written about the last couple years, nor was that written anytime soon. In fact, this was written in April of 1979, published in the Washington Post of all mainstream media outlets. There once was a time when economists cared about the economy, when economists actually looked at what was going on in the monetary system, when the financial media was more important, was, it was more important to the financial media to report the truth, the facts rather than merely spouting off what central bankers tell them to believe. And that's really the issue here. Over the many decades since this Eurodollar stuff first developed, what was a 20-year-old financial system that is understood by few is now a 60-year-old financial system, monetary system, that is understood by even fewer. And that's where this disagreement comes in, because markets don't have the luxury to ignore this reality, whereas central bankers there's no penalty for their repeated failures. And these repeated failures are pointed out by these markets. The markets have told you QE doesn't work. It's not money printing. The markets have told you Jay Powell is wrong about pretty much everything, just like Janet Yellen had been and Ben Bernanke and Alan Greenspan. So no wonder, as markets have said all year, something bad is coming, Policymakers, almost out of spite because markets point out their errors, have said, ignore all that curve information stuff. We know what we're doing because just ask us. And sadly, unlike 40 years ago, the financial media doesn't seem to really care about the facts and the truth. And now we're left with feces and fans. But before we get to all that dirty business, first, I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. While we don't focus a whole lot on fecal matter and fan blades, we do go over the background details about all this Eurodollar business in the 60s and 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, right on up until today. Various formats for you available. There's memberships at the Eurodollar University website. There's research subscriptions, a daily briefing that goes over some of the, the, the macro details and developments like we're going to talk about today. Deep dive analysis where we really get into the nitty gritty details behind all of these important developments, all of these important mechanics, the plumbing, all of its stuff and how it impacts our daily lives and what it means for the future. All the information available for you, eurodollar.com university. Now we've had from the BLS a series of inflation, if you call it that, really consumer price data, producer price data, export price data, all showing the same thing, one after another after another. First it was the CPI coming down, disinflationary pressures have taken hold, pointing us back in the, in the direction of last June. Something happened mid-year. Then we got the export-import prices for the month of December, like the CPI, same thing, since June. 
Today, the BLS gives us the third of the trio in the form of producer prices, the US PPI. And what, you, lo and behold, what do we find in the PPI? June, mid-year, something changed in producer prices. The numbers, strictly speaking, uh, producer prices for final demand, which is the one is the index that most people look at for the PPI, down 0.5% month over month, still 6.2% year over year, but that's the lowest since March of 21. And more importantly, as I was saying, you can see where prices are going and you can see when prices started going in that direction. It goes back to last year at mid-year. And that's important because in June of 2022, this was before the Federal Reserve really got going with its rate hikes. And as any per supporter of the Federal Reserve and its rate hikes will tell you, rate hikes, if you believe this sort of thing, it takes a, a, mon a serious amount of time before rate hikes have any effect. So how could prices across the board, and not just in the US too, remember we've talked about this overseas, but in the US, prices across the board, consumer prices, producer prices, trade prices, all of them started to change in inflection at mid-year before the Federal Reserve even got going. And we see it across the, in, in the various parts of the producer price index too. It's not just oil and energy. Uh, finished goods, minus 1.54% month over month in December, the annual rate of 8.84%, again, still high, but that's the lowest since May of 2021. And again, an inflection around June. The core PPI was plus 0.13% month over month, which is a low rate, lower than expected. The annual gain was 5.53%, also the lowest since May 21. And actually you see the core rate actually start to inflect way back in March of last year, and then again in August. So again, by mid-year, Prices, even in the core PPI, show you that something changed in the economy. Now, as far as what that change might have been, well, again, it wasn't rate hikes. The timing shows you it couldn't have been. It must have been a fall off in demand. Remember what we heard back in the middle part of last year, even before the middle part of last year. We started to hear things from retailers, for example. Target and Walmart in particular, back last May said, uh-oh, we've got too much inventory. And it looks like consumer behavior is being affected by what? Not rate hikes, by gasoline prices, by prices themselves. The inevitable downside impact of a supply shock situation, which I'm going to say it again, is exactly the scenario that markets have been pricing since the supply shock first happened in 2021. You look at the yield curve, for example, the yield curve began to flatten really going back even earlier, February, March, but after May into June of 2021, we saw the yield curve flatten, which is not an inflationary signal whatsoever. It was the markets increasingly confident that we were going through a supply shock. And that a supply shock would be transitory. And at the end of a transitory supply shock is demand destruction. Not demand destruction that just happens out of nowhere, but demand destruction that we can finally see in the form of a recession. The demand destruction happens all along as prices go higher and higher and higher. And as I showed in another recent video, as activity, economic activity is redistributed to the least, the, the least productive parts of the economy, such as shipping, such as oil and gas production, which has remained low no matter what. So the economy is increasingly harmed by high prices. And eventually it reaches a point where it's harmed too much that it can no longer continue. And when Walmart and Target last May said, we're worried about inventory, that was the sign that we had reached or getting close to reaching that tipping point. And the markets had already had already predicted that was going to happen. Because remember, the yield curve inverted for the first time in March of 2022, as oil prices were spiking in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But Eurodollar futures, that curve had inverted way back in December of 2021, which said the market was increasingly certain this was the direction the global economy was going to take. And it didn't matter what the Federal Reserve was going to do. Because as the Fed has hiked rates, 
the level of inversion, the back end of each curves has acted independently from those rate hikes. All along, you have been warned, feces and fans, closer and closer and closer together. Now, one reason why I say they've gotten pretty close together, I mean, we've, had, we've had all sorts of data come in that tells us, look, you know, soft data, soft surveys that said something really big happened November and December into the, the first part of this year. I talked yesterday about the German bund curve, uh, the changes there, which again, this is not a local phenomenon. It's not just a U.S. problem. It's a global problem. But strictly speaking in the U.S., we knew something bad was happening November, December into January. Again, soft data, we saw it in PMIs. I talked, to Empire, I talked about the Empire Fed yesterday. Now we get the hard data. And the hard data that pertains to the all-important Christmas shopping season. Retailers were already nervous heading into that season because, again, the, the warnings from Walmart and Target back last May didn't go away. Their nervousness, their concerns about consumer demand and the, and the possibilities of consumer spending holding up throughout the Christmas season had only amplified and grown as last year continued. And the, the BLS, or not the BLS, the Census Bureau just reported the retail sales number for the month of December. And what does it show? Well, first of all, there were big downward revisions to both October and November, so not a good start there, but retail sales in nominal terms, this is not adjusted for prices, down big in December, 1.15% month over month. That's obviously seasonally adjusted. Um, and what it shows you is that over the, the previous Chris, uh, December Christmas season, nominal retail sales were up 6.7%, which sounds terrific. And that's the kind of number that you've heard thrown around in the media all throughout that uh, November, December, and into January, that Christmas was terrific. Look, nominal sales are up 6.7%. Isn't that great? Well, no, because what that really meant was that in nominal terms, Americans spent 6.7% more than the previous Christmas to get 0.3% more in terms of actual goods. In real terms, retail sales were down in, in December, but only three-tenths three of a percent higher than they had been in the December before. That's not a good number. In fact, that's a horrible number. That's a number that will disappoint retailers, that will disappoint and trouble wholesalers who are still receiving way too much goods, and it will be an utter disaster for producers. Because retailers, with a bust of a Christmas season, are going to have to call up the wholesalers and say, we don't want any more goods. We still have too much inventory on our hands. And wholesalers who still have a ton of inventory coming in are going to have to call up their producers and say, stop producing goods. We can't take any more because they're not selling. Even during the Christmas season, the discounting, all that hoopla about everything that was good, it didn't happen. Consumers were unable to spend in the fashion that the entire global economy needed them to. And one way that I think it really demonstrates that, because this is a global thing, was in the retail sales report, non-store retail sales. Amazon.com, online shopping, down 1.1% month over month in December. And again, you see this in non-store retail sales. A pivot around this time July, mid-year. Consumer spending softened around mid-year in nominal terms as prices were reflecting consumer demand, a change in condition that markets told you was happening as it happened. And of course, as this is going on in the retail part of the supply chain, it's 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 already starting to, to filter its way down into the production parts as well. I mean, we've talked about China, industrial production over there, exports to the U.S. Obviously, they tanked in November and December because even before the Christmas shopping, even before the the Census Bureau tallied up all the receipts or the sample of receipts, however they do their, their estimates. Businesses had or retailers had already told wholesalers this is not going well. Wholesalers had already called up their suppliers in China and said, stop the production. We don't need more stuff. So China reported exports to the U.S. were sharply lower in November and December. 
Uh, obviously, they're all, U.S. wholesalers are also going to call up their domestic producers and say, we need to slow down production. We need to actually cut back in production. So the Federal Reserve also reported today on U.S. industrial production, and it was down sharply in December following a downward revised contraction in November. So we're starting to see industrial production begin to roll over into contraction too. The monthly number was minus 0.7% for headline IP. And that was despite a huge increase in utilities because of the blizzard throughout much of the United States. 3.8% month over month increase in utilities. So outside of utilities, in industrial output in December was really weak. In fact, manufacturing output, strictly just manufacturing output, was minus 1.3% in December. That's just one month following a minus a downward revised minus 1.1% contraction in November. And again, you see in industrial production, this transition from expansion up until around March and April, and then heading into this transition phase toward contraction, which seems to have been showing up, which seems to have shown up around November, December, and probably into January and beyond. Exactly the scenario that markets had pointed out all along as it was taking place. Which leads us back into this ridiculous question of Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve and economists and the financial media and their distaste for all of this useful, incredibly, I mean, validated information that is provided from markets. And they, they, they dismiss all of these signals for the simple fact that it exposes policymakers as the frauds that they are. Policymakers and economists fiddle around with these statistical models. They don't fiddle around with actual useful econ economic knowledge of the economy. They spend all their days in mathematical equations. And the markets say you should spend all your days in the stuff that the Washington, Washington Post reported, thanks again, Emil, the Washington Post reported way back in 1979. You should understand how the monetary system works, how the economy works, because that's what really will impact our lives. Remember what Jay Powell said earlier this year? We now realize how much or how little we know about how inflation works. He was, that was actually true. That was really true. But he doesn't, he, he won't admit that there are other parts of the system where there is useful knowledge about money, inflation, economy, and all these things. Because again, these markets point out Jay Powell is an emperor. He's not even a naked emperor running around saying, look at how wonderful my clothes are. He's just some crazy guy calling himself emperor. And the financial media goes along with the charade because they all want to believe in this technocratic ideal that can't possibly take shape with a monetary system that is as the Washington Post wrote many years ago. That it is extremely complex, at the same time delicate. A financial system that is understood by few, again, fewer even, more, even fewer today, that avoids regulation by any existing government body. The problem is that no one is watching. And in the sense of 2022, now 2023, that no one is watching is sadly, it has been literal. I'm Jeff. Thank you for joining me. This is Euro Dollar University. Get your umbrellas ready for the feces and fans and what happens after those two connect and in contact. As always, I appreciate Eurodollar University members. Huge thank you to all of them, as well as our research subscribers. And until next time, take care.